What is bee vomit? Is the question that I will answer by the end of this show. Hello and welcome to the very first episode of The More You Know Mondays. The more you know, the more you grow. And this is the very first episode where today I will be talking about the three day week. Now before I get into that, I want to start the show with an affirmation. Um, I'm going to do this every week. I'm going to call it Monday Affirmations because, uh, you know, Monday is the first of the week, the start of the week rather. And depending on when you're listening to this, maybe it's the beginning of your day or maybe it's the end of your working day. Like, it's nice to kind of, I don't know, I feel like it's nice to start the week with something positive. So... For this, um, I have an app, motivational app, that uh, shows me motivational quotes throughout the day um, that I get to kind of digest. Some of that I kind of just dismiss, but most of them I kind of look more into because I've got it in the widget part of my... Oh, damn. I can't remove that. The widget part of my home screen um, on my Apple device on my on my apple device on my on my iphone rather <laughs> and i thought that it would be cool to start the first episode or and every episode with a nice a quote you know so the quote for today will be by mike norton and it goes like this beethoven said that the sorry let me start again Beethoven said that it's better to hit the wrong note confidently than to hit the right note unconfidently. Never be afraid to be wrong or embarrass yourself. Which is why I just, you know, I didn't get annoyed at myself and redo it. I didn't plan that either. I I actually just fumbled before starting. So it was kind of nice that I went into this quote talking about not being afraid to fail. Um, I think that's a really important thing in life because, you know, we're human beings and we're not perfect articles. Um, But I feel like sometimes in life you feel that you always have to be on point. You always have to be like 100%. You always have to be showing like your best side. And sometimes, you know, it's okay to not be okay it's okay not to be like 100% all the time it's okay like to have a bad day because you know we're all human and we do have good days we do have bad days but like I think it's best to think of every day as a clean state a clean slate so like a new day is a start of something new as opposed to bring in on all of the, I guess, baggage from your previous day into your next day. And then you're kind of dealing with everything from yesterday and then dealing with everything that's happening today. So that's how I kind, I kind of try to look at things. But I think that's a really good quote from Mike Norton. Um, if you have a chance, look him up, look up the quote. It's a interesting one. It's a really motivational one for me as well so hope it motivates you out there on your mondays so yeah let's get into this the three-day week what is the three-day week you might be asking yourself and i asked myself the same question when i heard it i was i was at work and it was during the first lockdown and we were just kind of I think, uh, where were we? In the lunchroom. So we're in the lunchroom and one of the ladies at work, she um, started mentioning, talking about how 
this lockdown kind of reminds her of the three day week. And I was like, the three day week? Cheats. That sounds kind of lit. So what? So you mean like three days working, four days weekend? And she was like, nah, that's not what it's about. Like, so I want to go into what specifically happened or what the events of the three day week were. But before I actually talk about that, I think it's kind of best to give you kind of a background of what was happening around that time. So around that time, you have to understand this was the 70s, like almost 50 years ago. So we're talking around when this happened, it was 1973, 1974. So like, I mean, for a lot of us nowadays, like for me, I'm, I'm 28 years old. And thinking back to the 70s it seems completely alien to me because it was a completely different time technologically, um, politically. Well, I kind of get into that a bit later on. It's, it's from a lot of the research that I went into, it feels like politically what happened during the time of the three day week is kind of what really set up the political landscape that we have nowadays in 2020 with everything to do with Boris Johnson and everything like that. Like what was set up and what went down around that time was kind of pinnacle really. And if anything, uh, more than anything. And I think it's kind of weird for me kind of doing this research in my later life after going to school and thinking, right, I didn't even, they didn't teach us this in school. And they really should have like it's it's pinnacle maybe some people did learn about this in school I don't know let me not say we didn't learn this I didn't learn this in school but and I know like a lot of people that I've been a lot of my uh, friends and my peers that I've been discussing this with they haven't really they're not really aware of what the three-day week is and when I talk about it, they're like whoa but like yeah, that's basically the main reason why I started looking into it. So in the background, we have the world that we're living in, but imagine it flipped. So imagine like no, no microwave, because that's what they had in the 70s. They didn't have any well, around this time, 1973. They never really had microwaves. They never had ready meals. There wasn't uh, like no McDonald's, no fast food restaurants. Maybe they had like the odd chippy or like the corner shop. But apart from that, there was nothing. And on the backdrop of that, like what you need to understand is around this time, most of electricity was kind of powered from coal. So coal was like the new gold, if you want to think of it like anything like, like, like anything like that. So, cause, cause the coal miners and anyone who was a coal miner, they were like, they had, they were making the most in the kind of, in the, I guess, the industries of, uh, factories and stuff like that they they were making the most money around those times probably in the early 60s the 50s around those times when coal was the main source of all electricity but as kind of time went on there was a a global oil crisis can you imagine that like there was a global oil crisis happening and also there was an industrial dispute happening within the coal mining industry. I think that's a better way to sum up and say what I was trying to say (laughs) in the fastest way. So you have, in the global oil crisis, what you have is like oil prices rising and there's also really high inflation. Like, so you've got houses, housing prices rising. There's also a backdrop of war on um, when you think about uh, the Yom Kippur Ramadan war or it's also known as the October war but I can go into that deeper on another episode which I will do because there's all kind of interesting points in time that 
I don't know. If you don't know about it, maybe you're a historian, you do. But if you don't and you're just an average person, like I was before I started looking into all these things. <laughs> um, yeah, man, it's, it'll be great to learn more about. But anyway, back to the three day week. So obviously we've assembled that we've got war happening in the background. We've got oil crisis. We've got, uh, coal running out so i think that that's what it must have that's what no what it must have been that's what was happening coal was i guess running low in the uk around this time and there was a conservative government at the time which was run by edward heath which from listening to a lot of documentaries and watching a lot of things about this time and era, he's also known by known as Ted Heath. So, I mean, look into that because I, I was reading this article like, who is Ted Heath? And I was like, Ted Heath, but they said his name was Edward. Maybe, maybe I'm, I don't know about shortening words or shortening words, shortening names because. My name's Corey, and people shorten my name to Cor, which is like not really a step because you just removed the last letter. <laughs> um, but like with Edward to Ted, maybe Ted is the shortening for Edward. I didn't even look into that, um, surprisingly. Um, but maybe I will after the show and then share it with myself. Um, but yeah, so Edward Heath was the prime minister of the time in a conservative government uh, surprisingly not so alien from what we're going through right now with um mr boris johnson and what we have is edward heath running and from what i read and listened to like i said multiple times as you can hear um he's he's running the party in a time when, you know, the com the country before all the oil crisis and everything, they've had strong econ they've had a strong economy, they've had relatively kind of low unemployment rate, and then, you know, then also it's kind of interesting to also state that, or not even state mention that on the 1st of January, 1930, 1930, my bad, 1973, um, the United Kingdom, that the United Kingdom, that was when the United Kingdom first joined the European communities, which is now known as the European Union. And I think it's also important to mention the fact that when the UK did enter or first become a state member of the European communities, it wasn't when the European Union or European communities had first founded. So the UK was invited to take part in the talks that led to the founding treaties of the EU the Treaty of Paris in 1951, which established the European Coal and Steel Community, and the Treaty of Rome in 1970, 1970, 1957, which established the European Economic Community, which is the, EC, the EEC. Now, the British government did not engage in a significant way with these talks and signed neither of the founding treaties at the time, and it was obviously disliked by many people um, because, well, the European Union was disliked by many people um, in the in the British or the British in the UK because of um, super nationalism, which basically refers to uh, a large amount of power being given to an authority, which is the European Union which in theory is basically placing them higher than the state themselves. Um, so it's kind of like a intergovernmentalism force. <laughs> I guess kind of 
the best way to look at it, other than all these jumbled words that I'm saying, is it's it's like think of it like a super government. So kind of on paper, it sounds like a great thing. To me, it does. Um, but you know, there's obviously some people in this um, dystopian UK that we live in right now <laughs> that believe that we should leave it the European Union and so it happened but I voted remain <laughs> anyway as well as that um, the, the reason why I guess the U people, a lot of people from the UK dislike that kind of super nationalism element in the treaties is that they, they were kind of worried that it was kind of about damaging the links with the Commonwealth countries and they wanted they they saw it kind of as a, 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 a way to kind of pursue a one world economic system policy which involved a central currency which is the euro and the UK really wasn't about giving up this pound sterling you know pound was kind of worth a lot around those days I assume the, the rates at of, again, another thing I didn't look into. <laughs> Thinking about it now in hindsight, hindsight is, hindsight is twenty twenty, as they say. But uh, the year is twenty twenty, and I didn't look at it, so <laughs> I probably will look at it after this again. But maybe it's something that you can look into as well. Um, but anyway, so that's mainly the backdrop of why the UK didn't really want to join the European Union when it started but obviously the UK's non-participation meant that when it did decide to join the EEC in 1973 it meant that it had to accept part certain obviously it had to accept all of the policies that the EU stood for um, even though a lot, there was a few people, a lot of people, I guess, that disagreed with the whole system. But I guess it's, I think the most interesting part of this whole thing or of this whole uh, rabbit hole that I went down was basically that it was a conservative government that we had in power when we joined the European Union. And... It's also interesting that in particular, uh, not only that they joined the European communities, they in particularly, they, they joined, the, they, they were joining, obviously, they were joining the European economic community. Like that's, that's the part of it they wanted to be a part of. Um, and it was a conservative government in power. And when we're having this, uh, I guess, this Brexit vote, it, um, oof, I say it's years ago now. I think it's what, I can't even think back to how long it was, which is kind of crazy to me because it, it actually wasn't that long ago after looking it up. Like it's, it was only like four years ago, like the referendum for the Brexit vote was in, I think, what was it? I don't quote me on the dates exactly, but it was definitely March um, 2016. So it was only like four years ago. So it wasn't far, far in the future. But from how slow this year it's gone, it feels like forever ago. But enough of Brexit. This back on to thinking about the 70s and how crazy it is. Um, being, uh, thinking about the three-day week. So like, if we want to get more into the mindset of like kind of what was happening in the 70s, like, let's think technologically, because technology has made everyone's life nowadays so conveniently easy. There wasn't mobile phones, there weren't microwaves, as I'm sure I mentioned previously, but I'll tell you what there were. Around that time in the 70s, it was in that decade, let's say... It was in 1971 when the first email was sent. So almost 50 years ago from now when the first email was sent. And then we've got the first 8-bit Apple 
microcomputer came out in 1977. And funnily enough, the funniest thing I know I, I find about this fact is that their first um, console, <laughs> we'll come to that in a bit, their first computer that came out, they called it the Apple II. And their next computer that came out after the Apple II was called the Apple I. So marvel that in your minds, whatever. But also another thing to think about, uh, another bizarre comparison, just think about it. So in 1977 was when Apple released their first 8-bit microcomputer. Nowadays, most computers are 32-bit or 64-bit. So marvel that in your mind as well. Just think about how far we've gone, like 8 to 64 like bizarre crazy fast um what else do we have i i'm not sure if i want to mention the walkman because from my research again it, it seems like it was more of an 80s enjoyed item although it was released in 1979 <laughs> pretty much the 80s yeah so there's that but that was only like kind of invented in the back in the 70s another interesting thing that i found that was invented in the 70s was the c programming language so for anyone who's a coder or interested in it which i am <laughs> i'm studying it at the moment so i found this real interesting to find out that the c programming language was made its first appearance in the early 70s 1970s and the creator of the c language c language is often credited to dennis ritchie and his work at at and t bell labs and i'm pretty sure at and t is a mobile phone company but correct me if I'm wrong, I don't live in America. <laughs> and um, there was another thing. The first digital camera was created in 1975 by Eastman Kodak. So that's a cool fact to know. Like <laughs> the, the Kodak camera was the first ever, ever digital camera to ever be created. And it was made in the 19, in 1975. And another cool thing about that is that, you know about when you think digital camera, you're thinking like, whoa, the, the, the advanced digital cameras that we have right now. But no, this digital camera, the first ever digital camera was put together uh, with used with parts from other used cameras and it weighed like 80 pounds. So it wasn't anything small, but it was the first digital camera, mind you. So that was pretty cool. Another cool thing to mention about the 70s, in 1977, I think this is what I said from my research, um, the Atari 2600 was released. Um, and not only did that console put Atari on the map, but it also put console gaming on the map, which is another cool comparison to what's happening right now in the last maybe three or four years. And especially now in 2020, like with Twitch and, uh, what else is there streaming wise? Facebook gaming. <laughs> I saw that advertised somewhere. Um, they've got like, there's so many gamers, so many game creators. There's so many gaming, esports, e and everything that's happening right now. If it wasn't for the Atari company being created in 1972 and then them releasing their very first, I think this is their first console or releasing. Yeah. I think that, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, message me in emails. DM in a video if you're watching this on YouTube, like the hot, hot, the Atari 2600, 1977, put console gaming on the map and console gaming is now, it, it put it on the map and now it's only, not only just, but now it's everywhere. Everyone, <laughs> I'm thinking about it as like 
when you're growing up, when we, when we, when me and my generation were growing up, you might want to say like, what, what do you want to do for a living? Oh, I want to play get computer games. I want to be a gamer. Gaming isn't a, like, that's not a job. Like, look at it now. Like, you look on YouTube, you look on Twitch, you'll see these gamers and they're making money from playing games. And I, in the beginning, I didn't really get it. But like, now as kind of years have got on and people kind of gamers have explained it to me as it makes more sense. And I myself delve into watching games because like there might be certain levels that I'm finding hard to complete. And I know there's a gamer out there that's completed this level. He'll show me the walkthrough and then I'll just jump on the game and com- complete that level. I won't be stuck anymore. It's brilliant. <laughs> anyway, uh, is there any more cool creations? I think that's, I'll leave it there for the cool creations of the seventies, but just to give you like an insight of how limited things were back then compared to what we have now. So that's why I think it's kind of a real interesting topic, but I've talked a lot about the background before actually mentioning the actual events of what happened in the three day week. So, Basically, as I mentioned in the beginning of this pod, or this episode rather, a lot of the UK's electricity was produced by the burning of coal in the 70s. And the three-day week was introduced by Edward Heath as a way to kind of reduce electricity consumption. Um, And... In that way, they were. Tr- he was trying to conserve their coal stocks so that they didn't run out. And <laughs> a lot of people didn't agree with it. Obviously, you know they they had to go back to this rationing type of living, in, and people really didn't really imagine or couldn't imagine that since the war, and. There's a, there's a video clip that I, or video clip, a video clip? This is a podcast, an audio clip. <laughs> there's an audio clip I will play of the Prime Minister Edward Heath, uh, where he talks about him introducing the three-day week um, on the 13th of December 1973, which only actually came into f- an effect on the 31st of December, 1973, which then span over two months. As Prime Minister, I want to speak to you simply and plainly about the grave emergency now facing our country. Jobs will be in danger and take home pay will be less. We shall have to postpone some of the hopes and aims we have set ourselves for expansion and for our standard of living. We shall have a harder Christmas than we have known since the war. Um, But it's important to say that what actually happened or what came into effect during the three-day week order uh, was that electricity or commercial consumption of electricity would be limited to three consecutive days each week. Can you imagine that? So so you get three days of light and then four days of darkness. And it was it's not only that, it, it's also kind of the fact that the TV channels, all TV channels, and I say all like there was many TV channels back then. We've got millions of channels. I don't, it, it's probably not millions, it's probably thousands, but we have thousands. It feels like millions of channels. The, the list goes on on the TV guide. But back in those days, they had ITV, they had BBC, and maybe there was another channel. I'm pretty sure there was like maybe three or four channels back then because I know that when I was growing up, there was only five channels on the TV. <laughs> and then like Freeview came out and then it expanded everything um, without you could get free you could get all those channels extra channels without having to pay a subscription to Sky or something like that which was great but during the three day week however t- 
TV channels or the TV channels, every TV channel had to shot each day at 10.30. But this was only three days a week. And they also used to alternate kind of the days nightly between ITV and BBC on consecutive days. Um, so, like, so one day you would get BBC, on another day you'll get ITV. <laughs> so even though you had three channels, it was really like you didn't really, or maybe it was only two channels, ITV and BBC. So maybe you had two or three channels, but it felt like you only had one channel because only one was playing on that day. And imagine like you worked later than 10.30 or you got home later than 10, or later than 10.30, it's kind of late. Anyway, you, that wouldn't happen. But imagine on those days, like when they're, when there wasn't power and you got home from work and all you wanted to do is kick back and watch some TV and have a cup of tea, but you couldn't because you couldn't run anything. You couldn't run. Everything was run by coal and coal was limited. and like, Everything was off and every, you just probably have to get used to like torches and candles. That's crazy. It's absolutely crazy for me to think about living like that. And just deeper this, like the TV thing came into effect before the three day working week actually came into effect. So like the three, uh, the three day uh, TV uh, or broadcasting um, week came into effect on the 17th of December, 1973. So this was like, Five days after Edward Heath has announced it, the TV is announced. The TV channels are now or stopping at ten thirty p.m. every only three days a week, and then on the thirty first of December, you go into a full like shutdown of all power, only specifically for three days a week, and this period. So were of suspension went over Christmas, over New Year's period, and was only lifted on the eighth of February, nineteen seventy four. So, two months they were in these crazy, rationed electricity times, and they survived. And it was hard, obviously. I I was talking to my mum about this because she was born in the 60s and so around the 70s when this was happening she was probably a teenager and she says that she remembers it was a lot of family time and you know uh, candles being lit and stuff like that so it, it reminds me a lot of kind of what's happening now although there's one difference though the difference that I feel there is, is that nowadays, or not nowadays, now with the kind of, lo not the kind of, now with the lockdown that we're in, although we're closer together with being locked down with our family, I feel like at the same time we're, we're kind of separated in the sense that everyone's taught mobile phones and technology. And, and of course, like the invention of mobile phones and technology is a great jump in, in everything because I, I think I was, I was listening to this BBC Radio 4 documentary or audio mentary. Is that a thing? I've created it. If not, <laughs> a documentary on uh, BBC Sounds, uh, which is a, was talking about the three day week. And. I used it for a portion of my research and there was a part where he's talking about um, Edward. He's talking to someone that knew Edward Heath at the time. I think he was uh, possibly someone of exchequers um, uh, and he was talking to him about getting hold of the prime minister one time. And there was a time where and the prime minister was away on his yacht and he was trying to get hold of him. But they never had like mobile phones so they could instantly get hold of him. All they had were these kind of close circuit kind of radios that they could maybe use to get hold of him. But they, it, because back in those days, they never had the range that our mobile phones have. 
so it was hard to get hold of him. And I assume in those days, if someone was out of range of the radio, then you're going to have to wait until they're back in range before you can get hold of them or back at land, you know? So that's bizarre to think about. So passing information was slower. It's not as instant now, now, now as we have it now. <laughs> Funny. Um, and it was much slower time than now. Everything's so much fast. Everything's so fast paced now than it was back in the 70s and and that's one of the things that I find so interesting about this topic that there's so many comparisons and contrasts and similarities to what happened almost 50 years ago like almost five decades ago to kind of what is exactly happening now in our country in 2020 in the COVID pandemic. And we have the backdrop, obviously the, the the comparison for me is like, back in when we, when they had the three day week, the global oil crisis was happening. And nowadays, now we have the global pandemic happening, which is affecting the economy, um, people's mental um stabilities um because we're we're being forced to pretty much be on house arrest if you really want to think about it we we can't go anywhere um i think i was watching the last leg last night on channel four and jimmy carr yeah jimmy carr alan carr maybe it's alan carr i should look at this up no, 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 no. It's, it's, it's definitely Jimmy Carr. My, my, my apologies. It was definitely Jimmy Carr on the show. And he made this joke about how we're being in lockdown is pretty much like house arrest. And then he went on to saying that in his joke about how we should have, we should be tagged. And then I, I was just like, ah, oh, yeah, that would be a good idea. And then my friend I was on the phone to pointed out that like kind of is, that wouldn't be a good idea because then they would be able to track us everywhere we go. So yeah, <laughs> hope that doesn't happen. <laughs> but yeah, it is crazy this lockdown. Um, but I think the best thing for us to do is keep in good spirits and stay together with our family, uh, spend time with our loved ones because, because we don't know how much time we have. And I, I don't mean that because of the pandemic that's happening. I just mean that in life terms, we don't know when it's our time or when it's anyone that's close to us's time. So what I'm basically saying is just value the time that you have to spend with the people that you value in your life. Because it's quite important, to be honest. But back on topic, <laughs> it's, it's always, always also quite interesting um, to look at the fact of the landscape of enviro environmentalism, because around the 1960s was when um, the, the scope of the movement of, enviro of the modern environmentalism began. So in the 70s, they're kind of 10 years into the movement. And like now we're in full swing because we're still trying to stop what we started trying to stop 50 years ago, which is crazy. But at the same time, I think it's also important to mention the advances with the environmentalism that we have taken from the 70s to now, like we have... There's, they're slowly introducing electric, electric powered cars with hybrid technology and stuff like that. But I feel like we could be on the brink of maybe another oil crash. Possibly uh, oil prices could be rising soon because there could be an oil shortage again. Um, so 
I don't want to say that history is repeating itself because yeah, it seems to us like history is repeating itself. But I think that there were, I can't remember who I heard this from, but there's a very there's a very good version of that that I heard that I think is a better way of describing the events of history repeating itself instead of saying history repeated itself because then because by saying history repeat itself you're you're making history into kind of a a physical thing that can do things when really history is just the title that we give for the things that happened in the past so what actually happens is humans repeat history they repeat things that they that's already been done. That's what creates the time loop, I guess, of the historical loops and these historical uh, similarities. Because um, I don't know how long in the future it will be. Maybe it'll be another 50 years. Maybe it'll be 2080 and someone, something else will happen or someone will look back and be like, right, things have changed dramatically since 2020 and we thought that was crazy but that's the future i'm not living there i'm living in the present um the past i'm leaving it over my shoulder because i don't want to drag it into my present and be tracking it all into my daily living i'd rather leave it there in the past and live in the present like I said at the beginning of the show, you need to look at every day as a new day, like a clean slate for you to create something new. It's hard, obviously, to forget about the things that happened in the past, but we, we don't need to forget about them. We need to use our failures as lessons, use anything negative as something we can learn from to better our life or better ourselves or put ourselves in a better situation to the best of our own abilities in whatever given situation. Which is what I think the government of that day were trying to do. It it was, maybe it wasn't the right move to do for the Heath Ministry, but it's what he thought at the time was the right move with the limited resources that they had of power. And uh, also in that audio documentary that I listened to on BBC Sounds, um, they were talking about if Edward Heath didn't introduce the three day week, then you probably, people would have probably ran out of uh, power by March. 1974 so imagine that so imagine uh edward heath was just like nah it's cool it's a conspiracy don't worry about it guys this oil shortage i'm sure it will sort itself out let's forget about it everyone was running their power seven days a week rocking out enjoying themselves and then two twos the country went into a complete blackout from march until they were able to restock their coal so that it could start powering things again. So it's kind of like, it feels like his hands were kind of tied in that situation. Although it, it seems um, uh, extreme. It seems quite extreme to implement such rations in power, but it was necessarily necessary extremes for the time because it, it wouldn't be... Um, it wouldn't be seen as England or the UK to be a strong nation if they had no power and they wouldn't run anything. They couldn't uh, keep their economy going because they had no power to do so. Not that they didn't have the people. And another br- kind of brazen thing that I thought happened around that time was so just before while the three-day week was still in full swing just before the end of the three-day week um order which ended on the 8th of february um there was a miners strike right so this miners strike officially began on the 5th of february 
And then two days later, the Prime Minister at the time, Edward Heath, he called the February 1974 general election while during the three-day week. Can you imagine, like, someone doing that so brazenly? Like, he was like, rah, of all... Like, let's just... Let's just have an election now. So the miners are striking. They don't agree with me as a, me being in parliament, me being the leader, us conservatives uh, running the country. That's why the miners are striking, obviously, because we're, do- we're doing something wrong. So if that's how you feel, right, we'll have an election and we'll let the country decide what should, who should be governing England, who should be governing Britain. And... Um, I think that was the slogan um, that was used with the, the the whole general election. It just sprung on them. So in that general election, funnily enough, um, the Labour Party won. <laughs> and so the Labour Party were now running the country. Um, but it was kind of a surprise for the prime minister who won at the time. Um, it was Harold Wilson, who was also running the country before um, Edward Heath came into power, which is kind of interesting. So at the time uh, when he won, when he won, apparently he was quite surprised. And the only problem was that Labour won in the minority. So what that kind of means is they they won to be where Labour is running the country, but they didn't have the right amount of seats. Um, And I believe that around the time was when the Conservatives were trying to get some sort of coalition with the Lib Dems, but it didn't really go through at the time. And yeah, the, the, the Labour Party got in, and within the few years that they were in power for that, I think it was about three years. Um, they had Harold Wilson and then they had James Callaghan, who was the prime minister after Harold Wilson. Um, and when they did actually come into power, like usual, when the Labour come into power after Conservatives, they end up spending a lot of their time reversing the crazy things that the Conservatives kind of put into play, which is this, no different from this time at all. And another interesting thing to know is after the after James Callaghan was the prime minister from the Labour Party, um, we then dove back into I don't know um, seventy nine to ninety six, which is seventy nine eighty. 16 years, 17 years of conservatives um, running, governing the country. So, which started in 79 with Margaret Thatcher and ended in, uh, well, John Major was the prime minister from 1990 to 96. But yeah, that was the conservatives. And then after John Major uh, in 97 was Tony Blair, which is. <laughs> my my life I was seven (laughs) but a lot of the things that he did affects kind of a lot of the things that they that happened back then affects directly what I grew up in so I, I find it quite interesting which is why I think that more people should know about the three day week learn look deeper into what happened back then because you can learn a lot from history to kind of better the future. We don't have to do the same things that they did in the past to figure out, oh, snap, we're doing the same that we did before. We need to change. Obviously, we've been doing the same thing for a very long time and something isn't working. We definitely need a change, 100%. But what that change is, I think I think it's more a thing that maybe big oil companies that sell us petrol need to come to a custom with the fact of there's cheaper, more cost efficient, more energy efficient 
ways out there. That there, there was a documentary that I watched um, last year that ta- that talked about how that we have the technology right now to go completely electric on cars, but it's just about the companies wanting to make that money and don't want to relinquish the cheapness of electricity. But I hope that I have given this topic a very well-rounded look or exploration. I feel like I wanted to give you a little bit of the background while also talking about the topic, but then simultaneously, I hope too many things wasn't happening. (laughs) Simultaneously, I wanted to kind of talk about the comparisons of then and now and how it's kind of alien to think about but kind of at the same time not so different so really we should kind of take everything that happens to us as a grain of salt not everything but i mean world worldly events take it as a kind of a grain of salt because if you manage to live and survive through it not only are you strong but also you'll get to a point in your future where you get to look back on these events and think, wow, that was crazy. But we're now in a new crazy situation. (laughs) So I will be calling this the end of the show. And as promised, I need to give you the answer to the question that I posed at the start of the episode, which is to give you guys a reminder what is bee vomit? So let's give you the short version before I then go in and explain things. So basically, bee vomit is honey. What we love and enjoy as honey is actually also bee vomit. And now, where I found this out was, I can't remember the guy's name, but I was watching this uh, this uh, speech or this speaker talking about um vegans Uh, i'm not a vegan myself but i just find it interesting to learn more about things that i don't know much about (laughs) Um, so i was watching this speaker and he was a very very good speaker sharing (coughs) sharing what he was sharing um but i remember this poignant point that he brought up when he was like he started rambling on saying that be what you people enjoy as honey is bee vomit. And I was just like, bee vomit? It, it, the way how he was talking about it, he was saying it in a way to kind of warn people off eating honey. But I heard it, found it quite, like, quite bizarre that, we, yeah, we, we eat bee vomit. Um, but it's not the most bizarre thing that us as human beings do, you know, like, so... Like even the fact of another thing that I find crazy before I explain this whole bee vomit, bee vomit honey thing is that human beings are the only creature, only mammals that consume milk after infancy. And not only that, we consume milk, the milk of another animal. And the crazy thing for me is that if there was an adult that was still drinking breast milk you would look at him weirdly but people who drink cow milk that's normal now i'm sure like there's vegans out there that that would probably be like that's not normal and i don't think it's normal but it's unfortunately it's what i enjoy at this moment in time or i haven't really had milk per se in a very long time but that's another (laughs) another conversation but let's get into the bee vomit basically nectar is converted into honey in the bee's stomach and then it is it is regurgitated and stored in hexagon hexagon hexagonal uh, wax cells within the hive so honey is fed so Think about it in the regurgitation stage. 
the reason why they say it's bee vomit is because you know like birds when they um they might eat something and chew it up before feeding it to their young that's basically what bees do to their larvae so they'll they'll feed honey to their larvae and it will be used as served as a supplement for food for adult bees so honey is essentially bee vomit if it's regurgitated nectar and although it's not you you can see probably why people don't call honey bee vomit because if that was on the rest of if if you looked on your honey if it, instead of saying honey it said bee vomit you're like bee vomit nah, I don't think I'm I don't think I I think I'll leave that alone but it's actually kind of tasty which is kind of bizarre but there you go if you don't believe me check it out on Google look it up um, shoot me an email yeah get at me the best way to get at me is to probably send me an email at myopinionmeans at gmail.com or you can hit me on the social media platforms uh, if you look on all of our social medias we are at myopinionmeans on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter so follow, check us out uh instagram is probably the main one where i post most things but follow us on all the things because there's always things to see (laughs) um but yeah if you enjoyed the episode please give us a rating on apple if you listen to us on apple and if you listen to this as a audio podcast on youtube give us a thumbs up subscribe for more um share with your friends and of course thank you for listening if you actually got right here to the end of the episode because this is the first episode i wanted to start off nice with something interesting something cool something that you might not hear on a daily day daily day on the day to day all the time but this is the end i really do hope you've enjoyed the first episode there's more to come next week where I will be talking about no you know what no wait until next week thank you for listening and goodbye